own municipal law, uh, but it also <coughs> has the relevant planning citations in it, and the references are done in layman's terms, not a lot of heavy legal jargon. So quick reference, if you wanted to find the definition of site plan review in town law, you would go to the one third part of this bookmark town law and go down the table of contents and find section 274. So we do have, I did bring one of these books with me tonight. Anyone can have it, first come, first serve. But these are also available in PDF form on our website. Those are super convenient to scroll through and find things quickly. And all of our publications are available in PDF. We can also snail mail you the paper. So I left publication order forms out on uh, the sign-in as well. So what does site plan not do? It does not regulate a use. Um, it focuses on a single parcel. So it can have many buildings on the parcel. It can range from a single family home or a single car garage all the way up to a site plan like this that's a multi-use parcel. It's got a hotel and some restaurants and a gas station, um, but it does not regulate the use. The goal of site plan review is to regulate good design. You're gonna be looking at how the things on that single parcel relate to each other within the parcel and how they relate to adjacent uses as well. And that is gonna come in really handy when you're uh, thinking about doing a site plan as well. So it can be used with or without zoning. I know many people uh, here may not have zoning in their municipality, and for them, site plan review could be the strongest tool in their land use toolbox. It's important that you never regulate dimensional requirements or setbacks if you don't have zoning. That's called backdoor zoning, so you really want to avoid anything like that. And projects range in size, as I said. It could be for um, a single family house all the way up to um, a, a shopping mall. So what triggers your site plan review law? Well, that is set forth at the local level. Um, it, lots of things could trigger the requirement for a site plan review. It could be a change in use. So you could be uh, changing a big box store and those big box stores being subdivided into a lot of little retail stores. So perhaps that could be the trigger. Or it could be every single use in a specific district, like every use in your waterfront district or every use in your industrial district. Um, and always consider your comprehensive plan, no matter what application comes before you. Any application, you need to review that application in terms of the goals of your comprehensive plan. So it's not whether or not you personally like the project or even if your town board says this is a really good project and we want to see it go through. If it's not in harmony with the goals of your comprehensive plan, if it's not jiving, then there's a problem. That could be that your comprehensive plan is out of date or it could be that the project is not the right fit at that time or that place and maybe you'll have to um, tweak it to make it the perfect fit if you'd like to continue. <coughs> so your site plan review is also going to designate the review board. So this means, for example, your town board, sometimes the town board, uh, the governing board, may retain the review authority or they can delegate it to another specific board. For example, sometimes a town board, the local governing board, would want to hang on to controversial applications uh, when I first started at the Department of State, wind turbines were considered the controversial application. And that was, you know, 15 years ago. And driving up here today, they were like mushrooms all over Route 12. So it's, it seems like uh, they're less controversial now or uh, they're more common. I'll put, it, I'll put it that way. Or adult uses. Sometimes your governing board could say, you know what, we are handling all the adult uses and we will handle the review process. But most of the time, the local governing board delegates that review authority to the planning board. Sometimes they will delegate it to the zoning board of appeals. Um, if they do, that's known as original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction means that the application originated with the ZBA. It didn't have to go to the zoning enforcement officer first 
for them to make a determination and then go to the ZBA. Just it's, it just the paperwork starts with the ZBA in that case. Or it can be another authorized board such as your um, historic review board, for example. So once those applications are dedicated to, uh, delegated to a specific board, they <coughs> stay with that board. The local governing board can't say, we want to take that back, or you're not moving fast enough, or you're not doing it the right way, or we, we, want, we can do it better and we know the way it's going to go. There's no taxi backsies once they delegate it to you. Got it? It stays with you. All right, so next we're just going to take a look at a bunch of triggers for um, site plan review board. So here's an example of what the trigger might be in your municipality, for example. All use is more intensive than a two-unit residential, so a two-family residential. And in this bottom left here, we have a picture. You know, this looks like a motel, probably, or just your basic uh, apartment building. Over here, we have um, a diner style. So that could automatically trigger your site plan review, or maybe it's the fact that these are located in a very specific district. So this diner might be in the um, light commercial district, so that would automatically trigger site plan review. But again, it's up to you at the local level. So in Albany, our site plan review law may not, uh, this may not trigger it, it really would, but I'm just saying for the, set, for the sake of argument, it really depends on your particular local law. And here's another example. I think we can all relate to the Dollar Generals, right? Who doesn't have a Dollar General in their community here? Show hands. Yeah, I didn't think so. One, okay. Come to you soon, I bet. <laughs> now, now if they ever watch this, they know there's an opportunity where you live. But anyways, you know, these were a, a great chance for review boards to make these a perfect fit in their community. They don't have to look like the standard dollar um, general. So you can tweak them a little bit. And this one is not in a commercial district. It's actually in a residential district. When I did a Google search, Google area maps, aerial search, uh, this is right in the right smack <coughs> of a neighborhood. It used to be a tiny, uh, a a tiny grocery store, like a neighborhood grocery store, but now it's a, a Dollar General. And here's another example. Any idea what that is? That's self-storage. That's a nice looking self-storage unit, right? So these are, these are some things you can get when you ask. If you don't ask, you're probably going to get the basic single-story garage with maybe an orange door. Typical, um, typical uh, Storage, off-site storage. All right. So site plan review can be triggered by districts. I've already mentioned that one. This is downtown Albany. This is a neighborhood commercial district where we have a lot of um, first floor retail, mom and pop shops. Mom and pop live over the shop on the second and the third floor. So maybe that would automatically trigger the review. But Everybody's site plan review law should specify exactly which uses are going to require site plan approval, and it should also specify which board is responsible for that review, and it should also indicate who will enforce the conditions. That's an important part, because years down the line, you know, people forget this, the heat of the moment, what they're doing, and the meeting minutes may not make sense, and the conditions may not make sense, but the conditions are what your code enforcement officer is going to go with their hand in the future to make sure that those conditions are still being upheld. So they need to be clear and they need to make sense at the time and in the future. And specify your submission requirements. That could be, you know, will we accept digital copies? How many hard copies do we have to have? Um, things like that and have a list of local procedures. The public needs to know what's going to happen, what's expected of them. So they want to come to you with a full application. They don't want to come back month after month. Uh, it reminds me when you're in line at DMV, you get all the way up there, oh, now you need to sign this, and then you go to the back of the line. 
that is very that is very frustrating. And you want to be known as the community that is business friendly, that is friendly to its citizens, uh, and you'll get a lot better projects and maybe more of the better projects will <coughs> come your way. And certainly list the elements or the criteria for review. If an item is not listed, spelled out specifically in your local law, you cannot hold applicants liable for it. That's the end <coughs> of discussion. You might be able to ask them, but you can't require them to come up with something. So at the Department of State, we think if you have a checklist, that will make it easier for you and easier for your applicants. Easier for you because now you know um, what's expected. You won't be missing anything. You'll have less frustrations. Your meetings will run more smoothly. Applications will hopefully sail through. And it's better for the applicant to know exactly what's expected up front, um, including fees, anything like that. So I think that's good. And we can also provide you with samples of what other municipalities have done. So if you don't have a checklist, um, you don't have to start, start from scratch necessarily, but you do need to compare. Um, if I provide you with a list, you will need to compare that to your local law because you may have certain things included that I didn't include or we may have to um, remove some as well. So that goes both ways. Here are some examples of elements possibly that would come up for review. Any proposed grades and contours, uh, your drainage, sewer and water, utilities, traffic. We're going to be taking a look at all these. So this is just an overview slide. And again, only those elements that are specified by your governing board, by law or ordinance, can be reviewed. So can, uh, can you as board members add things on the fly when you're reviewing applications? No. Again, you can ask, but you can't mandate that the applicant provide those things. And if your local governing board wanted to add things after the fact, they would have to do so by the um, adopting a local law to update your site plan review law. It's as simple as that. So here's an example of uh, grading and stormwater. And since most site plans will disturb an acre or more land, you need to address stormwater retention, drainage, and soil erosion. Uh, this is, how many of you are very good at reading maps? Yeah? I think reading maps is really, um, well, it's not something you're born with. You have to be taught how to do it. So that could even constitute one of your trainings. If you um, have your local engineer or a consultant can come in, and or maybe you have planning staff, they can come in and teach you how to read these, um, these grading contour maps or erosion plans or stormwater management plans because some of them are very complicated. And it goes without saying, if somebody is coming in and doing grading or removing a tree for their project, chances are it's to the benefit of that applicant. But what is it doing to the adjacent property? <coughs> it could very well be creating stormwater or drainage issues for the adjacent properties. So that is why you need to be aware of the adjacent uses and what's going on in other parcels as well. And here's a little tip I learned from my friends at the Adirondack Park. Some uh, municipality up there had the regulation in their site plan review that a certain percentage uh, of trees had to be maintained on the land. So no clear cutting near the lake to improve the view. So for example, their local regulation said 40% of the trees had to be maintained <coughs> on this site. So what do you think the landowner did? They cut down all the big trees and kept 40% of the little skinny saplings. Yeah. So were they, in the, were they uh, conforming to the law? Yes, but they really weren't conforming to the spirit of the law. So you have to kind of think about these things. It makes sense, and if you want certain trees of a certain diameter or caliber, then you should be really specifying that. Okay, stormwater pollution prevention plans. These are SWIPs, and when it comes to stormwater management, the goal in New York State is to slow the flow. Anything that we can do to manage stormwater on site, and by 
by Mother Nature is always going to be much better than by gray infrastructure, which is pipes and gutters and man-made storm drains and things like that. But if your project is going to uh, disturb more than an acre of land, you need to have a SWIP. So we're going to reduce the runoff rate and the volume because when you make it easy for water to leave the site very quickly, that creates erosion and that creates problems for the adjacent parcel also. So anything you can do to slow that flow so that the water percolates and it's managed on site, we like to see that better. Um, so you can remove the pollutants from the runoff generated on the site. And you may hear the term low impact development. Low impact development means you're designing with nature and you're working with existing grades and contours, uh, not against it. And that is a little different from green infrastructure. Green infrastructure means you're managing that stormwater naturally through trees and shrubbery and landscaping. So you're using vegetation <coughs> and soil to manage that rainwater uh, where it falls. Earlier in the show, I said how important it is to compare your projects to the goals of your comprehensive plan. But what if your comprehensive plan had a goal to embrace low impact development or to embrace green infrastructure, and now a plan comes before you and it's not using any kinds of green infrastructure, it's just using the traditional stuff that a developer might hand because it's cheap and it's fast and it's what they have on hand. But if you didn't know to compare the project to the goals of your comp plan, you might not know any better and you might just let that sail through. And so that's what we're always hoping that you, uh, you're you aware of what your goals are and you really make your projects conform to those goals. Here's just another example of a detail sheet. This is uh, your, your utilities. Know, site plans and the attached detail sheets should contain information for all overhead and underground <coughs> utilities. It should indicate the size. Here, um, if you can't see it very well, it indicates sanitary laterals and storm trenches, sanitary, sanitary trenches, sanitary lateral cleanups, um, all kinds of stuff that I know nothing about. Uh, <laughs> underground utilities or even above ground utilities. Uh, some residential districts now are mandating that they provide all of their utilities underground to the extent practicable. I don't know if they're doing that in this county. Um, it's very expensive to do that. But even though some places are mandating that they go underground, we have 5G coming around the corner. So if you're in a community where your utilities are underground and 5G is coming, you still may have a pole outside your neighborhood with your 5G attachments on it. So that doesn't seem to be exempt from the requirements. So traffic impacts are something uh, very important to every site plan review project. Because let's face it, uh, we have more cars in America, more drivers, and these projects are likely going to bring more traffic into your community. So the review board has to look at the potential for additional traffic associated with proposed new development, and you're gonna try to check out how is that gonna impact this project and the adjacent projects as well, because you, um, you're gonna be forcing more traffic onto the feeder streets. And what's the current capacity of the surrounding road system? What's the expected increase in traffic counts? And it's not only when the project is completed, you have to do traffic impacts for the construction phase as well, because that can really back up traffic or create traffic problems. And sometimes these projects can, can last years, so it's important to be aware of that. This I stole from the DEC's uh, Seeker Cookbook, Seeker Online Workbook, excuse me. This just gives um, a traffic impact. Uh, you're not mandated to use this chart. Actually, these numbers come from California, so you have to stop and ask yourself if they're really 
uh, still relevant to your neighborhood in upstate New York. Um, but they are they provide just a basis point for traffic impact traffic impacts and the number of peak hour trip thresholds that a project would be expected to um, to have. So on here we have a fast food station, fast food restaurant with a drive-in. So. The In-N-Out Burger in California, you know, it's, it's no secret we have an obesity epidemic in the United States and in New York in particular. Uh, and California was ahead of the curve and they said, we're putting a moratorium on all drive-throughs uh, because we want people to get out and walk. But this was before the pandemic, when, so I realized things have changed significantly when we didn't want to go in stores and we were so grateful to have uh, drive-throughs, but they did have a moratorium on drive-throughs, and I think about where I live, our, uh, one of our number one goals in our comprehensive plan is walkability, and when our McDonald's burned down, it was a single bay uh, drive-through for that McDonald's, it burned to the ground and they rebuilt it, and it's one of those with the double drive-throughs on both, so six cars can line up at once, and I think, how does this encourage walkability? We are just encouraging more car, more people to stay in their cars rather than to get out and, and <coughs> walk. So again, compare it to the goals of your comprehensive plan. And access management, you know, the closer together that your entrances are, the more potential you have for crashes. Um, Department of Transportation and the police, they don't call them accidents anymore, they're referred to as crashes. So the more, um, the more of these you have and the closer they are together, the greater the chances for more crashes. So the name of the game here is to limit the access points and increase the space between those entrances. And you need to take into consideration uh, the site distance, how easy it is for people leaving that parking garage to enter onto the parking lot to enter onto the main road. Can they see well enough? And the same thing for people entering that parking lot. Uh, where are the nearest intersections? Is there a side road access or internal roads and parallel access roads? So if you have like a major uh, manufacturing company or a major employer coming, maybe it's wise to consider one of these parallel access roads so that at rush hour, when all the cars are trying to get to work at seven, eight, or nine in the morning, they're not backing up traffic on the main road, and your main road may be a 55 mile per hour, and you certainly don't want to see people like at a dead stop on a, on a highway like here is the e ingress and egress. Uh, anybody see anything weird with this one? How did this, aside from the sign pollution, that's kind of <laughs> confusing. Uh, this, is, this is an actual street picture that we took. So apparently this site plan review mandated a sidewalk right here. But a sidewalk to me, <coughs> like if you were with a carriage or in a walker or something, uh, you'd be protected for about five feet before you'd be forced out into this two-lane highway.
some point in our lives. Disabilities take many forms, I recognize that, but um, seven out of 10, they're either permanently or temporarily disabled at some point. And if it's, if it's not us, then it's likely our loved one. So when you're doing your site plan review and you go out and you do a site visit, I really think it's important that you walk the walk. Imagine what this use is going to be like if you were walking with a cane, if you were pushing a baby carriage, or even if you were on a bicycle. Like You've got to get in the mindset that not everybody is in a car, and then you'll start to see the layouts of these uh, projects perhaps a little differently. Here's another example from Albany. Uh, they say if you build it, they'll come. If you put the bike racks out there, you know, people see, oh, how convenient it is. It's right there. I'll, I'll take my bike to the Honest Way Food Co-op. At the Department of State, our bike rack was next to the dumpster. <laughs> Literally next to the dumpster. So, I mean, what does that tell you about, you know, promoting walking and biking? Um, it has since been moved to inside. But that's only because people were complaining, and we're trying to do the right thing and make different modes of transit available for more people. And it's important that you have pedestrian-friendly parking placement, and things should be pedestrian-friendly in scale and with visual interest and with access. That can mean putting your buildings closer to the road with the parking in the back or the parking off to the side. When you do that, it really tells people um, subconsciously that the preference is not on the almighty vehicle, that it is on people first and vehicles second. And here we have some examples of building orientation and some architectural features. So this is McDonald's in downtown Saratoga, and they have form-based codes there, and that means that people have to build to a specific size and shape, and the building needs to relate to the public realm with sidewalks and pedestrian features, rather than designing by what the actual use is. So in this case there, Four-Base Code said, we need a two-story building built close to the sidewalk and close to the road with this kind of um, windows facing, facing the street. That second floor is empty, but it looks really nice, doesn't it? Because it's infill development, and they were trying to get away with the single-story architecture like this, which kind of leads to sprawl. So they were trying to fill it in with the existing neighborhood, and even though there's nothing going on up there, it looks good and it relates to the city and it increases their community character. Down here we have a traditional Monroe muffler, and these are not, these are false windows. The real action are the bays that are turned perpendicular to the main road. Traditionally, we see garages and muffler shops, you know, parallel with the road, right? So you drive by and you see a bunch of open bays. Uh, does that promote the kind of community character that you want? Maybe it does. But if you're trying to um, go for something a little stronger, a little um, more charming, a little more, a little friendlier, you can rotate the building so that these bays are perpendicular to the road. And these windows here are false facades, but it does blend in with the regular neighborhood with this buffer strip and, and the lighting and the landscaping. Down here, this is downtown Troy at a busy intersection. And I would say this is a less, uh, less successful in terms of planning application because this is a very busy four, uh, four corner intersection and this is where the buses all stop. And <coughs> on the other side of this building is the alley. So cars can come in through this entrance and go through, they could have gone through the drive through on the other side and exited through that alley. But instead they have the parking lot up front in the public realm where it could have been more off to the side. Does, does that make any sense mm -hmm. to folks? I think it was like a lost opportunity. They could have put the building closer to the public.
solid ground and it would have had a different look and feel. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a joke. I don't need to explain <laughs> that one. Although on my way up, I did see one of those water filling stations where you put the quarters in. Mm -hmm. And a car was literally in, it looked like that. It wasn't up against the, it was like a gully and the car just tipped in and I thought, how did they even, how did they even do that? If they were turning in, they must have been going like three miles an hour. So I don't know how they would. I wanted to stop and take a picture, but I would have caused more of a problem. All right, so lighting is one of those under, um, hmm, how do I say it? People need to take lighting more seriously with their reviews of applications. Uh, lighting can cause light pollution. But certainly we do need lighting, we just need the right kind of lighting. We don't need light pollution, we don't need light trespass, and we need to be aware of our energy usage and our energy demand. So there are some options. Um, here's light pollution. If you have a globe type light like this, the lighting comes down and around on, on everyone. Same thing with this kind of uh, light, you see these in big parking lots. Um, over here is a gas station, and these are special lights so that they are anti-glare. And they have demonstrated through lighting studies that when you, especially in a rural area, when you're coming off a highway into a very dark area, it's hard for your, your eyes to adjust to the new darkness and glare. And so they have special lights here that will cut the glare. Um, you know, lighting is important. They're drawing conclusions now with blue lights and Alzheimer's and lighting has to do with the migratory paths of birds and bats and it has to do with when chickens lay eggs and it has to do with the life cycle of mosquitoes. So when you introduce a, a, a large facility that has lighting you know, like a big factory or a big mining operation in a rural area, maybe it's got those big strong lights, uh, it possibly could be disrupting the environment. It's just something to consider, and you could hire, um, you could do a lighting study. Noise is subjective. Noise is any sound that you personally do not like. The proper word <coughs> is sound. Because noise is subjective, it cannot be measured. But sound can be measured in decibels. So when you're doing your regulations, um, <coughs> that is something you may want to consider updating. I know it all says uh, noise, uh, noise pollution or uh, sound. And if you have uh, concerns about a particular application and the sound or the vibrations that it's going to have on human health and human psyche, and animals, then you can hire um, an acoustical engineer and do some sort of study there. That's your option as well. Landscaping and buffering are very important. When you're looking at, we'll be looking at a lot of slides for landscaping, but it's important to know the difference between evergreen trees and deciduous trees. You know, evergreen stay green all year, and deciduous drop their leaves. So if you are requiring um, buffering landscape, you know, to shield a view or to attenuate a sound, then you're going to want to have something that stays green all year and doesn't lose its leaves in the winter, and it wouldn't be providing um, that whatever you're asking it to do to shield a sight or a sound or even a smell. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, storage refers to snow storage or even trash storage. <coughs> So where are you going to push all the snow that we get in upstate New York and that stays on parcels about eight months out of the year <laughs> sometimes? Uh, you need to designate a place on the parcel. One reason is if somebody's pushing the snow off their parcel, are they going to be pushing it onto my parcel, creating more of a problem for me? Or are they you know, pushing the snow back into the city of Watertown on the sidewalks, creating a problem for um, pedestrians? And also, um, <coughs> here we have your trash receptacles. Do you want those shielded from view, or do you want them covered with materials so that they blend in and match the surrounding architecture and materials? And here's a 
typical site plan. Uh, this is just very typical. This shows some, um, it shows the survey map, it shows the location map, and anytime that you are referring to maps in your meeting minutes or in your public hearings, I think it's a very good idea to also include the date of the map because sometimes those maps start flying, they're updated. It's really important that everybody's working from the same map and referring to the same map. So that's a little tip for you. Um, if these layouts should show the existing and the proposed buildings, roads and site access, parking and loading areas, <coughs> sewer and water, stormwater, and other utilities. And a good map will even show the adjacent uses or maybe even the adjacent um, owners. So that's for quick review. And this is a sample of detail sheet. And each one of these you'll be seeing like in a larger full size, full size version. So we don't need to go over everything on these um, sample detail sheets. So the parking plans, you know, parking is such a third rail in planning. You know, where I live, they think that our Broad Street is dead because we have no parking. Like, that's the cry. Oh, we can't do anything. We can't get businesses because we have no parking. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to come to this restaurant because there, there has no parking. Well, I challenge them because some of the best places to visit when you are a tourist don't have parking. Right, some of the tightest little coastal communities, really great places to go and visit and vacation. They don't have parking. You know, it forces people <coughs> on the outer parking lots or they to take shuttles or to carpool or to walk or take a bike. So there are um, options and just because you don't have parking or the right kind of parking doesn't mean it's the death of your commercial district or your waterfronts or your um, whatever. So a good parking plan will show the location and the number of parking spaces. And those parking spaces, um, the ADA compliant spaces, that depends on the size of your parking lot. Smaller parking lots that have four or less parking spots have to have spaces that are accessible, meaning that somebody with a, a handicapped vehicle could use it or a handicapped user could use it but they are available to all users and they don't necessarily need a sign in front of them. So for ADA compliance, you need an eight foot wide space and for an ADA compliant space that's van accessible, it needs to be a 12 foot wide space. So the parking plan would also show um, signage and the location and the dimensions and the measurement, the materials of those parking spaces and the drive aisles, um, loading areas, the dumpsters, the bypass lanes, um, landscape islands or refuge islands as they're called, and importantly, the turning movements for the largest vehicles to access that site. The largest vehicle isn't necessarily the fire truck. It could be you know, one of those 18 wheelers or a double tandem vehicle. So if that applies to this application, you would want to show that on your site as well. Here's a typical parking detail. Yours may look like this. Um, I was at the Surefine in Clayton. Anybody here from Clayton tonight? This summer I was at the Surefine. Right outside the main entrance, there was something that looked like this. And I saw a guy in a motorcycle just cruise right on up. And of course, I couldn't keep quiet. And I said, excuse me, but that's a handicap sign, a handicap spot. And he said, no, it isn't. That means it's for motorcycles. So we have an education problem, folks. And it's not just at the sure line. We, uh, I was at my gym, and well, this one happened to be striped blue for handicap accessibility. I was at my gym, and at the, the very last parking spot closest to the gym building, was diagonal striped in white. <coughs> and I pulled up in his giant truck and mm -hmm. parked right there. Mm -hmm. And I thought, he must think that means this is for trucks. White stripes means big trucks can park here. So I really don't, I don't know what goes through people's minds when, when they see these spots, but the, the diagonal striping definitely, 
is there for a reason, and it's probably a public education and outreach uh, problem. But today we see parking details because of the pandemic. We see, you know, these, this one happens to be handicapped accessible, but now you see restaurants in store with what? To go orders, pick up only, call ahead orders. So they really are pivoting and responding to the needs of um, today. I've seen Wegman stores uh, up near the front. They, don't have, they have their handicap accessibility, but they also have pink stork signs. Mm -hmm. Expectant mothers, let them park closer to the store. So I guess it can just reflect the needs of your community, what your parking details um, can be. And here's a landscape plan. Typically, these will show the location of the plantings, and they'll have an attachment of the chart, a, a chart attachment, listing the trees, the ground cover, shrubs, um, how many of each plant, what size they should be, the names of the plants, and whether or not you're going to have an irrigation system. You know, another good thing to have on these plants is who's responsible for the maintenance? Is it going to be the applicant or is it going to be back on the municipality, especially if these are in the buffer strip close to the road between the sidewalk and the road, or maybe the boulevard going down the middle of the road. And here's an example of a tree planting details. You know, it makes sense that you would want to use hardy species for your native species because they are hardiest, they're drought tolerant, they're, you know, they can handle the winter. So just because we can plant a palm tree <coughs> up here doesn't necessarily mean we should plant a palm tree um, because is it really going to survive two years after the developer has moved on to his next project. But there's a lot going on here. This uh, shows the, um, the mulch. It shows the ball of the diameter. It also indicates the, the caliber, the, the diameter of the tree. Again, if the, you're asking for um, landscaping, and you're asking for six shrubs or six trees, be very specific because you're trying to, um, you're trying to make it a good fit for the project. And is your goal stormwater prevent stormwater management, or is your goal to provide beauty and shelter or home, uh, birds, that kind of stuff? Uh, it all depends on what your goals are. And here is another view of the tree in the sidewalk detail. And this one's indicating the brick walkway. Um, but another thing you're going to want to ask the developer when it comes to tree planting and landscaping is what do these things look at look like in 10 <coughs> years and versus their fully grown um, what do they look like 30 years or 50 years when they're fully grown this is important because a lot of people have solar panels on their roofs now so you're not going to want to ask for a tree or some plantings that are going to overshadow uh, someone's access for solar power Here's just a sideway view, a sagittal view, and the benefit of something like this, you know, we're seeing the full development, the, what these trees look like when they're fully grown out. You can see them relative to the size of the, the light pole. You can see the distance <coughs> that they're um, planted, and you can really see how all of these elements come together. The fencing, the lighting, the pedestrian, elements with the bandstand and, you know, the um, benches for seating. So something like this is really advantageous to get an idea of what the project is really going to look like at, at the fully built out stage. So lighting details, these are often touchy subjects for communities um, also because you may have very general guidelines that say we want to have historical like lampposts. But what does historical mean? Does historical mean that this neighborhood was from the Victorian period, from the mid-century, or you know, was it the turn of the century? Historical can mean it's something different for each person on the review board and for each neighborhood. So you really need to tighten that up and make it fit the look and feel of that uh, particular project. And the lighting detail should also include the type of bulbs that you're going to be using and the wattage. And you can require downcast lighting systems.
so no like trespass um, escapes. So if you had a project with a bunch of these lampposts, and maybe two or three were too close to a business or a home, and instead of scrapping it all together because the light would be going into their, um, their living room or their office directly, what you could do is a, to keep the look and feel going of that project, what you can do is paint the inside of this globe black, the, the part that would be facing the building. You can just paint that out so that the light isn't shining into their building. And that way you can still get some continuity going with that particular lighting detail. And you don't have to have that, you know, look, oh, are we missing one? Did, did they forget about one? Or it just, it just looks a lot better. So, oh, I've got to really, i got to spin, i got to go a little faster here. So, Seeker, um, this is the State Environmental Quality <laughs> Review. We do a two-hour show on this. We also have an online training on our website. So this is a very quick review. But before you make your final decision, <coughs> you have to complete your Seeker determination. The whole point of Seeker is to gather information. It's not a yes or a no, it's just an information gathering process. And the more information you can gather from the applicant, the better your decision is going to be when you finally make it. So it's a good idea to require the environmental assessment form, the EAF, with every application so you can just staple them together and hand them to applicants. Establish a lead agency if you're going to have a coordinated review because only one agency needs to be in charge to shepherd this process through from beginning to end. And you have to make your determination of significance. <coughs> that is where you decide, yes, there will be an environmental impact, but just how bad is it going to be? What is the magnitude of that impact? If you have a positive uh, declaration or a negative declaration, um, if you have a negative dec, then, it's, then your determination is considered finished and your review stops. <coughs> a complete application means you have that neg dec was issued. If it's a pause dec, that means we're going to probably have some um, environmental mitigation and we're going to do a draft environmental impact statement to look at that a little further. And all of this seeker comes under the New York Codes of Rules and Regulations. Every state agency has their own book of rules and regulations. DEC happens to be in part 617.8, <coughs> so that is why all the seeker stuff is there. So public hearing is not required by statute, but it's a good idea to have one. You're not required, but it's always a good idea. It's a good idea because the whole point of a public hearing is to solicit comments from the public. It's their chance to pipe up on what this project means to them or why they want it or why they don't want it. Uh, the public means anyone with a heartbeat. They don't have to be a resident. They don't have to be a citizen, and they don't even have to speak English. You can hold your public hearing within 62 days of your completed seeker application. If you had a draft environmental impact statement hearing, you can hold that in conjunction with your site plan review hearing. You don't have to do two separate ones. They can be held at the same time. You are still held to the standards of the open meeting law, so you have to publish a legal notice in your newspaper of general circulation. This is a paid subscription newspaper. It is not the freebies that go around. You have to do so within five days, um, at least five days prior to the hearing, and at least 14 days if you had a draft environmental impact statement. And mail your notice 10 days before to the applicant, to the county planning, if, if applicable, and to the adjacent municipality. So 239M, this is mandatory county review. Many of you don't have professional planners on staff, so um, avail yourselves of the resources at the county level. <laughs> um, they, they are wonderful sources for professional planning. But if your project is within 500 feet of any of these things, it must go to the county for their review before you make your decision. It's very important that you don't say to yourselves, uh, we really like this project, we're going to okay it, we're just waiting for the county approval. Don't, don't make any 
adjacent municipality. It's just putting them on alert. Hey, we have this project. You might be interested to know what's happening. You don't have to wait for a response. Um, you just put it in your meeting notes or on your checklist that you sent notice to them. You can do it by fax or by email or snail mail. Again, you don't need to wait for a response. The direct appeal, um, this is when you have a site plan review application that also needs a variance. Typically, somebody <coughs> has to go to the zoning enforcement officer first for them to make a determination before they can move to the next step to the zoning board. With the direct appeal, the applicant goes directly to the ZBA first. They bypass the determination of the zoning enforcement officer. This is a great step. It saves uh, frustrations and bureaucratic red tape. Because what if somebody uh, approved the project first? What if the planning board approved the project and then it got to the ZBA for the area variance and the ZBA said no? Then the project's dead in the water, right? And you can't go forward. So it makes sense if you have uh, an area variance in conjunction with site plan to take the direct appeal. Conditions, uh, conditions have to be directly related to the project itself. Um, for example, landscaping and drainage. You can't say of the applicant, we want you to fix this drainage issue across the street. There's got to be an excess, a connection between this application and the conditions you're trying to impose to make it a perfect uh, application. The board can waive certain requirements if it's in the best interest of the municipality for health, safety, and general welfare. And the local governing board has to give the review board that ability to waive ahead of time. They can't do it on the fly. So in this example, their site plan required screening, but the screening was already existing for the adjacent municipality. So why would they have to require two different types of screening? It's redundant. But you would want to make why you were waiving the screening requirement, because this hedgerow may not always be there in five years. The new owners may say, we don't like any greenery. We want wide open space. And so the code enforcement officer is going to come back to the original applicant and say, now you have to put up screening because that was a condition of your approval. I think this should have been up closer. Um, a lot of you are lay people, and some of this is very complicated. You can hire your own professional review services. That can be a consultant, an engineer, an attorney. Um, and you can charge the applicant back for those review costs if you have it in your local law. Um, so another option could be, it could be a municipal line <coughs> item in your budget. And that puts the onus, um, it takes the onus off of you and you can rely on your own professionals. Uh, you're not necessarily relying on the municipal official. You may want to hire your own attorney. Maybe you don't want to, um, you don't, for whatever reason, want to talk to your municipal attorney or you want to hire your own engineer. You can do that with this option. So if you have an application uh, that has a residential component to it, uh, like subdivision or site plan review, it's presumed that new people coming in will put pressure on your existing parks and open space. If there's no place on that parcel for parkland, <coughs> recreation, and open space, you can ask the developer to take money into a kitty or in lieu of parkland where you can use that money elsewhere to develop <coughs> open space. But you have to be able to make a strong case for this. You make that case by going back to the recreation and open space component of your comprehensive plan. That's another reason why these things need to be current, so that you can look back and say, oh, well, we do have a lot of tennis courts, but nobody's playing tennis. We, we need skateboard parks. You know, We have a, a cohort of, you know, we have a new, new group of people in our community, and they're all 6 to 18 years old, and our parks should reflect more of their needs. Or we see um, the baby boomers now. They need parks dedicated to their um, physical abilities. And universal design means that these things are not targeted at a specific age or physical ability level. They're there for every use, no matter 
matter what your age are or ability. So you can use this to upgrade your parts to universal design standards if you wanted to. Security agreements, sometimes uh, like landscaping or your sidewalks, certain <coughs> things cannot be installed due to weather. Um, so if these improvements can't be installed before you issue the C of O, and the C of O is <coughs> really that carrot and stick, you don't want to hand it over until the very last minute. Because if you hand it over too soon, that developer may be like out of town and may never complete certain projects. So you can have a security agreement that can be uh, cash and escrow. Cash is king, that's always the best. You can have a performance bond or a letter of credit. And enforcement, your local regulations should authorize your code enforcement officer or your zoning enforcement officer to enforce the conditions of the site plan as agreed and require that those approval conditions be met to the extent practicable before you hand over that C of O. And this can be stated in your site plan law, your zoning code, or it can be identified in the duties and responsibilities of the code enforcement officer. You have to make your decision within 62 days after the official close of the hearing. Another good reason to use that checklist, so you'll have your timeline on there, so you won't be in default of this. File your decision with the municipal clerk within five business days. It's important that you know what constitutes filing with the municipal clerk at the local level. Sometimes it means the clerk actually date stamps it. Sometimes it means um, when it's under the control of the clerk, it's putting it in their inbox. What happens if you're a municipality that's only part-time? Your clerk only comes in two days a week. When is that officially filed? When they finally get to it or when it was in the box? See, that's why you have to know what makes an official filing because the clock starts ticking for that 30-day statute of limitations for the applicant or for anyone else to file an appeal. You want to shut that door as soon as possible. You don't want to leave that door open for somebody to come at you at a later date, even 10 years down the line, because you failed to officially file it. So any decisions at this point don't go back to the board. They don't go back to the governing board. The applicant has to file a certiorari or an mm -hmm. Article 78. Essentially, they're suing the municipality. Mm -hmm. And here is our uh, telephone number and our email at the department. <coughs> I can take some questions, or we can take um, a very short break and start with um, special use permits. Five minute break? Sounds good. Okay, all right.
the cane. <laughs> Or everything. 
living in the historic, uh, the historic district. So just like we were uh, the triggers for the site plan review, it can go by the use itself or by the particular district or even an overlay zone. An overlay zone means an additional layer of review that straddles a couple of underlying zoning districts. So this particular example is a fueling garage, fuel station down in Woodstock in the Hudson Valley. And we don't see many of these anymore where you actually can get your car fixed and get some fuel um, in this particular neighborhood. But this gas station was allowed by special use permit in what they call their neighborhood commercial district. And perhaps this is because, you know, they still wanted the good old fashioned car garage where you could get some repairs done in the neighborhood and they wanted to get fuel. And maybe the conditions of saying yes to this application meant that we're not going to see any cars out in the parking lot overnight. Like we don't want to see hoods up and car parts out. Um, we want that cleaned up after 6 o'clock at night. We don't want any flashing neon signs saying, you know, lotto, lotto, or, you know, get your beer here. We don't want any of that. And we want it to blend into the commercial district. Uh, we want similar architectural features and materials as what is existing in Woodstock. And if you've ever been to Woodstock, you know, there are no high rise buildings down there. Everything is, you know, one, two, maybe three stories high. So very human scale, a lot of community character, and this one kind of, um, blends right in. Here's an example of a special use um, in a district, and this can be accessory apartments in single family <coughs> residential districts. And there can be a, a, a stigma associated with these because they think, oh, our neighborhood is going to turn it well. Our neighborhood is going to turn into like just a bunch of little apartment buildings. I know what you're all thinking, short-term rentals. That's what you're really all thinking. Um, but in this example, they're granny flats. And in order for this to blend into the community and not to stick out like a sore thumb in the existing residential district, the special use permit said, you know what? This addition or this conversion has to look like the main house. So you can see these shingles are new. They will weather to a nice dark brown color. But the windows and the architectural style um, it all blends into the existing architecture. And if you are um, considering, considering uh, granny flats or elder cottages, the Department of State has a couple of model laws for aging in place. And we also want to remind you it's very important that when you're drafting your regulations to avoid the word family. Like don't say this, this granny flat or this elder cottage is for um, the senior or their or their family because once you get into defining what family is, you could have some unpleasant surprises. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's considered an invasion of privacy to make somebody explain who their family is. So it's better if your regulations say this home is for the senior or for their caregiver. That way. Maybe um, the caregiver could live in the flat, the senior remains in the big home, or vice versa. Um, but we do have two excellent local, excellent model laws on senior housing. We also have reservoir protection overlays. When we have overlays districts, they are there because they are supposed to be um, protecting an environmental feature or a very special feature. In this case, this is the Ashokan Reservoir. And so, of course, you don't want to have intense uses on a surface reservoir where we get our drinking water, right? You want to keep the public away from that as much as possible. Um, you don't want to have multi-family <coughs> housing. You certainly don't want to have cemeteries, plant nurseries. You might be wondering why. Um, because, um, you know, with wind and invasive species could take hold and and grow in this overlay district. And you know, a tough one is recreational vehicle parks, RV parks. These are often very beautiful places, and this is where people want to camp and put their RVs. So you have to really um, consider um, special use permits that are very, very strict if you're going to allow these. And you probably don't want to allow them in your 
traditional family um, family job up there. So you you need to balance what the goals of your comprehensive plan. If you want to see that waterfront overlay, um, some uses for tourism and commercial. What kind of commercial? Um, it's up to you. But again, these all need to go back to the goals of your comprehensive plan so that you're making the best decision based on what your community has already said it wants in that particular district. So a ridgeline protection overlay. This was another one from the Hudson Valley. Um, and the point of this ridgeway overlay was to preserve their scenic view sheds. And I bet you can't even see, uh, this is before the houses were built with a special use of it. They were built right on the top of the ridge line. Um, it interrupts everybody's view shed. If you live up there, I bet you're pretty happy. You have a gorgeous view. But with a special use permit, look, there's a house built right into the um, right into the hill. It's not interrupting anyone else's enjoyment or view shed, but that was done through the conditions of a special use permit and saying it didn't, it could not interrupt the ridge line. And you know, another, <coughs> another reason for ridge line production is maybe it's just not smart to develop on the very top of our ridge lines um, for safety reasons and for environmental reasons. You've got to think, is it easy for school buses or for first responders to have access to these properties as well? And of course, there are always exceptions to this. Um, for farmers, we always give them relaxed exceptions and relaxed zoning. So maybe you'd want to exempt out accessory structures and architectural structures. So I don't know if you have ridge line protections here, but that, you know this is exactly where you would want a wind turbine, right? Along mm -hmm. the top of the ridge where the wind is strongest and it's under uninterrupted wind. So it goes both ways. If you're a community that's embracing uh, renewable energies, and maybe you want these things on your ridge lines, but this particular community in the Hudson, Hudson Valley, uh, wind turbines is not their concern, but it was the scenic view shed that they wanted to protect. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts and the different kinds of permits and other considerations. So there are certain special use permits that can be considered temporary, but they need to be spelled out ahead of time. So it, um, this allows the review board to reappraise an application after a year. In the case of the senior housing, uh, when the senior no longer lives there, or they've moved on, maybe that you want that property to revert back to its single family um, status and you don't want that particular unit to be potentially turned into a short-term rental possibility. Um, maybe new facts and circumstances come to light and you would like to uh, review that before renew it. But typically speaking, because this is a function of zoning, zoning runs with the land, not with the applicant. So when you issue a, temp a special use permit, it stays with that land. We'll get into those details a little further. But some other temporary uh, SUVs might be for seasonal uses, farm stands, uh, the Christmas tree sale that you might have, or the pumpkin sale. These are temporary. And they require authorization from your governing board ahead of time um, because these are deemed, a, they are typically a permanent uh, fixture unless it specifically says temporary, and you can't say temporary on the fly, it's got to be in your local law, in your local zoning law ahead of time. So we do have some renewable permits. So if the renewal application is subject to the same review as a new application, and the SUP can't be denied <coughs> if the circumstances haven't changed. So nothing's changed and it's subject to review, and then the applicant has hit all of those criteria, then it should be renewed. Um, in this particular case, this is an echo house, Elder Cottage Housing Opportunity. It came from Tompkins County, Better Housing of Tom Tompkins County, and the idea is that this dwelling unit would be removed after the senior no longer needed it. 
So it's my understanding that these were not as successful as had hoped because they had trouble removing the units after the senior moved on. It turned out to be quite costly. So I, I, this is an old example, but I want to bring it to your attention because you have to think, okay, if this was a condition of the special use permit that it needs to be removed, whose responsibility uh, for removing that will that be? Does that go back on the homeowner or is that on the municipality? Um, you got to figure that out. Religious and educational uses are lupa. A lot of municipalities are scared when they have an application from a religious ex, uh, institution or a school because they think we have no control over this. It's our lupa. They can cite wherever they want to cite, and there's very little we can do. We just have to like bend over, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, these institutions are deemed to serve the public, so they are very good, so they do have a relaxed standards, um, but they require reasonable accommodation in the review. So if this is still a use that's going to impact uh, your health, safety, and general welfare of your community, then you could say um, no, or you could, Im you could add some really strong conditions to that application. You know, one that we, uh, one question that we really get is uh, the Main Street conversion, um, empty storefronts, and somebody wants to come in and put a church, and they think, well, we can't do anything about it, it's better, you know, it's a church, we've got to let them do that, and I said, no, not necessarily. You can ask for an economic impact study, because once you take one of these institutions and you replace it with something that was um, bringing in taxes to your community coffer. That is an economic impact that's going to be hard to make <coughs> up. So there are places where churches and religious and educational uses do belong, and they usually are in neighborhoods because traditionally people used to walk, walk to them and not use a vehicle. But you do have control over them, and you can regulate for health, safety, and general welfare, just as you would any other use. Now, mining is another uh, touchy one that is regulated by a special use permit. You can say as a community, we don't want to have mining anywhere in our municipality, <coughs> or we're going to restrict it to this district or this district. But once you open the door to mining and you say, yes, we want it, then it falls under the purview of DEC and they handle everything. What you can regulate at the local level are the non-mining aspects of the mining operation. So dust control and the egress or the heavy haul routes, you know, you don't necessarily want these uh, big tractors going through residential neighborhoods or maybe through schools um, if they're carrying hazardous materials. Um, but it does fall under the mind law, the mind land reclamation law, and the environmental conservation law. Now we're on to the review authority. So the governing board determines who will be reviewing special use permits. So they can hold on to this action themselves, or they can delegate it to a specific board. So your local law needs to say, um, <coughs> the authority, uh, they're doing that to another board, like the planning board, or the ZBA as original jurisdiction. Remember, original jurisdiction means it's coming to the ZBA first. It doesn't have to go to the zoning enforcement officer to make a determination. They skip that step. They go directly to the ZBA. Or they could go to another board, like the Historic Preservation um, Board. So we have a further option to delegate specific reviews to other boards. Here we have the city of Geneva. They have a historic district. Um, so maybe your governing board can say the planning board is authorized to do all, the, all of the reviews except reviews that fall in the historic district. Um, applications in the historic district instead are reviewed by the Historic Architecture Preservation Commission or the board. But again, it's got to be spelled out in your local law first. It's not done on, on the fly. So standards, so without standards to guide the review, your decision can be invalidated. So this means that every special use permit has to have standards. So that means you're spelling out what you want so the applicant can meet those standards. <coughs> Um, you're not always moving that bulb pulse. They, they achieve that standard and then you say, but no, we want this, and now we want this. You have to have
have everything set forth ahead of time so that the applicant can meet your, your demands or your standards. Otherwise, the courts will invalidate that application and your, uh, invalidate that decision that you made. And that was set forth in this uh, case, Shepherd versus ZBA of the city of Jonestown. So standards can be general and specific. So general standards apply to all special uses across the board, but specific standards are just that. They are targeted to um, certain uses. And when you have general standards, they'll generally, they will generally be upheld um, because they usually have this phrase, general standards, in consideration of public health, safety, and general welfare. That's pretty broad and generic. Uh, and otherwise, they might say, shall be in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the zoning ordinance and the comp plan. Again, very broad. It's going to reach about a lot of people. But specific standards could be, design of the new primary and accessory structures shall be consistent in scale, materials, and character with the existing vernacular architecture of the surrounding neighborhood district. So when I showed you that picture of the senior housing uh, development, the garage conversion apartment that was similar in scale, similar in architectural details and materials, those were the standards that that applicant met, and so the SUP was approved. So here's an example of where a community just had those generic general standards to cover their trash receptacle um, and their general standard said trash dumpsters must be provided and screened from view. Right? That's pretty general. That's and that's what you get. You you have something general and you get something general. When you ask for something more specific, if you are a community that's really got some teeth and design guidelines and trying to develop community character, you might adopt specific standards that say trash dumpsters must be provided with screening using materials, colors, and design appropriate in the character of the primary lot. So this, this one probably matches the restaurant that, you know, like a macaroni grill or something with similar colored bar. And this is where I like to tell you, like this is where the fancy raccoons go on their dates. <laughs> when they want to when they want to go all out, they go to this fancy dumpster to eat instead of this generic. But again, if you don't ask, you don't get. So I'm just trying to encourage you as board members to adopt standards and regulations. And you know, standards are just that. They hold the weight of law when adopted. You know, guidelines are suggestions. This is kind of what we'd like. These are guidelines. Regulations have teeth. They hold the weight of law, as do standards. Um, the only exception to that is if you formally adopt your guidelines as regulations, then they too hold the weight of law. But generally speaking, <coughs> um, guidelines are just merely suggestions. They're what we like unless you formally adopt them as law. So you can also waive requirements. Um, the review board can determine if the requirement isn't needed in the interest of public health, safety, or general welfare, or if it's not appropriate for that particular property. But in order for you to waive anything, you have to have that permission granted to you by your local governing board ahead of time. And here we have another um, case on that. We won't get into this. But if you are using your checklist and um, you would want to indicate that you had the ability to waive specific standards because they weren't right for this particular uh, property or they weren't needed for public health, safety, or general welfare. You don't want to be arbitrary and capricious. You want to back up everything you do, um, CYA, as they say, and um, put it in writing why you made your decision when you did. And here's the uh, example of waiving the um, buffer requirements. In this example, there's an existing <coughs> natural buffer present. Consider waiving it. Um, but again, put something in there in the event that these trees or this natural buffer doesn't exist anymore because you're trying to shield a view or to provide an enclosure. And if that disappears for some reason, 
you want your enforcement officer to go back to the property owner and say, you need to install something because the purpose was to shield the view and nobody's shielding this view now. So you review procedures. Here is Seeker again. You have to complete Seeker before making your final local decision and hand out that EAF with applications and establish a lead agency if you have a coordinated review so that some one agency, one person, one group is shepherding this of significance, including whether or not it's a positive declaration or a negative declaration. And then you will have a complete application when a negative debt is issued or a positive debt is issued and the draft environmental impact statement is accepted for public review. So your public hearing, this should sound familiar. The purpose of the public hearing is to solicit comment. Everything before the ZBA gets a public hearing. But as we've learned, it's not always the ZBA reviewing special use permits. So you still have to have a public hearing within 62 days of your complete application. If you are using your checklist, your timeline, you will be right on target with this 62 days. You don't want to run afoul of that. Um, if you have a draft environmental impact statement, you can have your public hearing in conjunction with the special use permit <coughs> hearing. You don't have to have two separate hearings. They can be one on top. They can be in conjunction with each other. You still have to obey the open meetings law, meaning providing notice to the notice to the media and access to the public. You have to publish a legal notice in the newspaper of general circulation. You know, the difference between providing notice to the media, you're just letting the media know. It's up to them if they want to show up or publish it or whatever. But when it's a legal notice, this is a paid legal notice, it's a lot of money, um, it's got to be in your newspaper of general circulation, not on um, a freebie, at least five days prior, and extend that to at least 14 days if you're having a draft environmental impact statement. Um, you also need to post notice on your municipal website. I didn't mention that before. The applications that you are reviewing, whether you're on a planning board or a ZBA, need to be available for the public to review on your municipal website 24 hours in advance. That is a change due to the COVID, uh, the pandi a response to the COVID pandemic and the open meetings law. So it actually makes it easier for the public to participate. Uh, other, you know, otherwise, a lot of people like um, may not come in person, still want to know what's happening in your community, and now they can. Mail notice 10 days before the hearing to the applicant, to the county, if that's applicable, and to the adjacent municipality. So um, the county takes a regional look at the impact of the special use permit if the project applies to real property within 500 feet of any of these, municipal boundary, uh, boundary of a state or county, park or recreation area, rights of way of state or county roads, county owned streams or drainage channels, and you know this, this other one, boundary of state or county land in which a public building is located, this counts for all kinds of public buildings, garages, salt sheds, you name it, they don't have to be occupied uh, buildings, they can even be storage buildings. Or boundaries of farm operations in state ag districts. The only thing that's exempted here are area variances. So be a nice neighbor and notify adjacent municipalities if the application is within 500 foot feet of that municipal boundaries. You don't have to wait for a response if you're using that checklist market, market in your meeting minutes, so people will know that this wasn't overlooked, it just applied or it didn't apply. The direct appeal is when the special use permit also requires an area variance. You would want the applicant to get the area variance approved first before getting their special use permit approved. So the direct appeal means they're not going to the zoning enforcement officer first for determination, which is usual. In this case, they're going directly to the review board um, who will decide yes or no on the area variance. 
and then they can proceed if approved with their um, special use permit request. So what is the basis for your decision making? Um, you have to grant the permit if your local requirements are met. So in this uh, case, Pleasant Valley Home Construction versus Van Wagner, this was a case of um, people in the community not wanting a manufactured <coughs> housing community being built. So even, you know, formerly known as trailers or trailer parks, they are manufactured housing communities. And the applicant, you know, the community said they wanted this and the applicant met all of the standards, but it was the community outcry, the vocal majority saying that they didn't want it. Um, and they had to mitigate their environmental impacts before making their approval, and they made their secret findings prior to making that final approval. So just because people are loud doesn't necessarily mean they're right or you have to bend to the will of the local of the local majority if everything else has been satisfied in the application. So zoning runs with the land. It does not run with the applicant, with the landowner, or the occupant. People could die, they could transfer it, they could sell it, but the special use permit stays with the land so long as those conditions are met. When the conditions are no longer met, then the, the special use permit can be removed through a public hearing. So special use permits can be denied, but they have to base that denial on reasonable grounds. You can't be arbitrary and capricious. Um, some examples could be the site is not appropriate for that use. Um, property depreciation, that can be a very viable reason for denying an application because not every application is a perfect fit for that neighborhood and it may um, have a very serious impact on adjacent um, property values. Or there can be traffic impacted beyond what would ordinarily be permitted by that use. And you can support your decision by having a traffic impact study, by having an economic development study. Um, you can ask for all kinds of studies that will support your decision. In case you ever are challenged, you'll have something to fall back on, and it won't appear that you were just being whimsical or arbitrary and capricious. Or capricious. The wrong reason for denial, as I mentioned before, is community opposition, and you can't base your denial solely on generalized <coughs> objections or concerns of the neighboring community members. Here's an example of a bar in downtown Albany, just a picture. So this applicant, uh, this picture is unrelated to the case, but in this case, Holbrook Associates versus um, McGowan, this was a case for a bar in a residential area. And there were a lot of general objections from the community saying, of course we don't want a bar in the neighborhood. It's going to be loud, it's going to be loitering, there's going to be people up all night, all over the place, cars. <coughs> and, you know, the courts, the courts were saying, well, these are inherent things with having a bar in a commercial area or a neighborhood commercial area. So these are general objections because it's presumed that you will have some of these um, attributes <coughs> associated with this use. So the wrong reasons for denying an application is if the applicant has an unrelated violation. We've all maybe we know some of those bad apples, right? They are they are well known in your community, um, and you just don't want to grant one more permit to this person because you know that they're not going to be good um, caretakers of the property. Uh, or if they have violations on different properties, you can't hold that against them. You have to review every every application as a fresh application unrelated to their history, no matter what it may be, or any previous violations. And the review board has expressed statutory <coughs> authority to impose conditions. That's the whole point of a conditional use permit or a special use permit. You are supposed to be adding conditions. You're supposed to be. That's the whole idea. But they have to be reasonable and they have to um, relate to the land itself, the impact of the development itself, and 
and it should not relate to the internal operations of a business or an activity. That's always a really tricky one. If you have an application like that, please contact us and we can guide you through such an application because you don't want to be accused of meddling in the internal affairs of a business operation. However, there are very few times when it is permissible and we can help you with that. How can you regulate the hours of operations? Only if you are authorized to do so by your governing board and you have substantial evidence of the impacts that relate to the physical use of the land. So in this case, Old Country Burgers versus the Town of Oyster Bay down on Long Island, this is the precursor to Burger King. And when they were re reviewing the special use permit, the review board said, okay, you can have your drive through but it can't be open, um, for example, from 11 to 1 and from 4 to 6. Those are exactly the times that people would want to use a drive through right? Rush hour, lunch hour, and dinner hour. So that was deemed to be interfering in the internal operations of a business. We have a wonderful um, uh, legislative, we have a wonderful opinion of counsel here. I recommend you take a look at that. Another time a review board was able to review the hours of operation was in Syracuse. There was a baseball field with um, big lights in a residential district. And so it was deemed um, to have an environmental impact to have that light flooding at all hours. And so they put, they capped when they could have um, the outdoor lighting for that baseball field. Mm -hmm. So that was deemed, but you have to be able to connect the dots between the impact that it's having, the environmental impact, or, and relate that to the physical use of the land. So your findings, uh, we do have a document that's very helpful, the role of findings in local government decisions. I recommend you get that. Um, but findings connect the dots between your decision and your local law. So if you're ever challenged, it should be crystal clear why you approved or denied an application. And a, a conclusory statement is the applicant didn't meet the standards, or the applicant did meet the standards. Yes, that's a true statement, but there's no meat on those bones. And that doesn't help anyone in the future to try to understand the method to your decision making. So when your findings are more robust and you can point them back to statute or to law or to the environmental impact you're trying to mitigate, if you are challenged, you have a better chance of um, prevailing. And include an analysis of your evidence, relate the facts to the legal standards, and file that with your decision document. And after the decision, um, by the way, there's no anonymous voting when you're voting on these things. Your meeting minutes have to show who voted and how they voted. So no anonymity there. So you have to render your decision within 62 days after your public hearing officially closes. That starts that clock ticking to allow somebody to come back and challenge. File that with your municipal clerk within five business days because that starts the statutory, uh, the state statute of limitation, that 30 day period that somebody can come back and challenge. And if you don't formally ever close this, then that window of opportunity remains open forever for somebody to come back and challenge and you don't want that to happen. So if decisions are not appealed to the governing board, they are appealed to the Supreme Court in, an, in a certiorari, that's in Article 78, where the applicant is suing the municipality. And revoking that special use permit, you can revoke the permit when it's no longer in compliance, so the conditions are being <coughs> upheld, uh, you need to have substantial evidence, and you need to demonstrate that they failed to comply with any conditions that you imposed, and it just doesn't happen willy-nilly. There has to be a public hearing before revoking that permit. And you should authorize your zoning officer or your code enforcement officer to enforce the special use permit conditions. This could be stated in your zoning law or it can be stated in their official job description and duties. And require that any conditions be met before 
issuing that permit or the certificate of occupancy. And we finished four minutes. So if you have questions, um, have to take them now, or you can always reach us at the Department of State. That's our bread and butter answering questions. Yes? Does uh, revocate, does abandonment constitute revocation? That, the question is, does abandonment constitute revocation? So that depends on how abandonment is, is defined. Abandonment can be defined as, you know, it's not operational for a year, or if there's a fire, um, 50, you know, whatever percentage of the footprint is destroyed. But that depends because it, is the use, does the use have to remain um, operational as one of the conditions of that permit. So it really depends on the original conditions of the permit. Thank you. You say um, if you have a work, the town has a work site. <coughs> yes. Um, open meetings law changed, was updated <coughs> for, um, in response to the pandemic so that people could have open open meetings, virtual meetings. By the way, that got suspended September 12th. Mm -hmm. So if you want to still have um, virtual meetings, you have to have a quorum in at least one of the public places available to the public. There needs to be a quorum. And you have to adopt a local law for extenuating circumstances. The state does not define what the extenuating circumstances are. They leave that up to you. Um, but if you wanted to continue with the virtual meetings, we have more information on that. But another part of the pandemic open meetings law was that <coughs> if you have a municipal website, your applications, your whatever records you are formally looking at for review for your meetings and hearings, this includes your agenda setting meetings, those records and documents need to be available on your municipal website. Mm -hmm. That means scan them and put them up 24 hours in advance at least. In addition, you have to have a physical copy for the people, for the public to look at, you know, at where you're looking at it in your wherever you're having your meeting. So that's shocking for a lot of board members who are like, oh, how do we do that? How do we scan our stuff? Um, you have to do it to the extent practicable. It's the, the world changed, and this is their response to keeping government open and keeping people uh, participating in open government.
After 30 years. Well, did you get a retirement? I can't draw the camera until I'm 55. I'm only going to be 53. But even if you have that many years, you can't do it? I have to wait till I'm 55. Oh, I thought it was 55. Four or some years. I guess it's E. No, 30 years. 40 years. 20 years. Fire and Oh, okay. All right, what municipality are you with?